Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Kriti Hegde. I'm a pediatric oncologist uh, at SRCC Children's Hospital managed by Narayana Health. Today we're going to talk about neurofibromatosis in children, which is a rare yet uh, a common disease that we do come across. It is a disease which is involving a lot of systems and to know more today we have Dr. Uh, Anaita Hegde with us who is a senior consultant uh, in pediatric neurology uh, at SRCC Children's Hospital managed by Narayana Health. Uh, hi Dr. Anaita. So we would like to know uh, more about uh, neurofibromatosis and what is neurofibromatosis? Can we start there? So neurofibromatosis is a relatively rare condition that we see in children and adults but predominantly with its manifestations in childhood. It's a genetic disorder. Uh, you have two types, neurofibromatosis type 1 and type 2. For all purposes today we will be discussing neurofibromatosis type 1 because it's relatively more common and seen in the pediatric age group. It is uh, rare means it's about 1 in 3000 or 1 in 2000 children would get neurofibromatosis. It's inherited 50% of the time from one of your parents. That means your parents may have it as well. And 50% of the time it's a de novo mutation means it's just like a bad luck situation. Neurofibromatosis means neuro means nerve and fibromatosis means fibrous tissue. So it's a combination of nervous as well as fibrous tissue combined together usually arising from nerve sheets as a result of which it's got the name of neurofibromatosis. It's uh, manifests as early as childhood and can go right into the adult age group. But the evolving phase of it happens in the first few years of life and that's why the pediatric age is very important for this. Right. So now that you've told us what this disease is, can you tell us how do you identify when a child walks into your clinic? How do you identify that somebody has neurofibromatosis? What are the features you look for? So neurofibromatosis has numerous features. So the first thing that makes you realize that this kid might be having neurofibromatosis is the cafe au lait spots. What are cafe au lait spots? They are little brownish spots which are seen in the skin at different parts. They may be small when you are young and as you grow older, the size and the number of these cafe au lait spots uh, change with time. Cafe au lait means like cafe, like a coffee, coffee with milk. So they are light brown in nature and they are quite clearly demarcated on fair skin as well as on a darker skin. Other than the cafe au lait, you get freckling in the axilla. So that's your axilla and if you ask the child to lift up the hands, you'll see little freckles which is there. Then you can have scoliosis which is a curvature of the spine which comes usually over a period of time. Then you can have things around the iris of the eyes which are called leash nodules. You can have little gliomas which grow on the optic nerve which is a little concerning sometimes which is seen in childhood which is on the optic nerve. You may have little lesions which are seen in the brain. And that's where we as pediatric neurologists come into the picture. And on an average, other than uh, getting the history of inheritance from a parent, so you check the parent and ask them if they have any lesions, or you have the genetic uh, marker, which is the NF1 gene. If you pick that up, then you have a confirmatory diagnosis of NF. Right. So all of these clinical features, is there a timeline or do you see all of them all at once? No, no, no. So when you start in the childhood, you may only see cafe au lait. So uh, you have to monitor this child. You have to watch the child over a period of years, preferably at six month intervals. So the ones you're worried about is the cafe au lait in the childhood and then the optic nerve glioma. They come in the first decade of life. Once you've passed that first decade, you start focusing on other things to look for. So the neurofibromas which are seen, the small ones which are on the skin, which are seen like little nodules, they're usually benign, they have a cosmetic disturbance, but other than that, they do nothing to us. Right. But the neurofibromas, which are the plexiform neurofibromas, which may be seen as large lesions on the mouth, on the back, on the trunk, around the orbit, inside the spinal space, internally or externally, those can be associated with concerns. One, they can become malignant with time. And two, they may press on a nerve or they may press on some tissue and cause structural pressure related effects. So those are usually seen in the early years, the optic glioma and the cafe au lait. The leash nodules, the freckles uh, usually come in at later in age. And then as you go into a little bit of childhood, uh, neurofibromatosis is also associated with learning disabilities, 
uh, ADHD. So these things, if you they are in your mind already, you know you have to screen for them. You know you have to ask about it. You have to send the child for assessment, find out about school issues, so that you pick it up early and start working on it. The adult variations are uh, there's nothing new that comes up in adults, except that many of the time some of these lesions may turn malignant with age. So that's the concern in in adults with NF1. Okay. So say we've made a diagnosis of NF1, how do we then approach this case? What needs to be done next? So if the kid comes in and I've made my diagnosis, one is I sit and counsel the parents. I explain everything about what is NF1. Uh, they're very concerned about the genetic aspect because when it's come from one or the other parent, there's always that concern about who is it come from, whatever. And very often the parent is oblivious that he has NF1. He's just got those two lesions on his body and that's it. So you want to highlight that it can be a relatively benign condition with nothing through your entire life and you don't need to worry. At the same time, we need to watch your child at regular intervals so that till he passes his childhood age group, I would like to be a little watchful. After that, hopefully it should settle. So after you've made the diagnosis, the next thing you would do is screen for all the different systems that are involved. So we discuss eyes, we discuss spine, we've done skin, we need genetic testing, we need counseling for this family. Uh, if you have an obstructive neurofibroma causing pressure anywhere, what is the system it's interfering with? We look into all those different aspects. We identify what is concerning the child at that stage in his life and we refer him to the specialist which is over there. Then we confirm it with genetic testing. Once I have the proof of the genetic testing, today with the advent of genetics and with treatment options, there are certain drugs which are now available in the market uh, which can be used for specific gene deletions. So today with precision medicine, if I identify what gene it is, I would be able to maybe find a medicine that could help you to some extent at least in shrinking these neurofibromas or treating them accordingly. So today with the advent of genetics, it has actually changed the way we can treat numerous conditions, particularly neurological disorders. Once you identify what gene is uh, causing the neurofibromatosis in your child, there, is, there are some medications today which can be used particularly on different genetic abnormalities. So that's the role of what we call precision medicine okay. that with genetics today and I'm hoping in the future we'll have a lot more medication that can be used either to shrink the tumors or to prevent them from coming in the first place so that we can change the course of the disease going forward. So, I would like to emphasize that while we can't change our genes and we can't change our genetic code, doing the testing very often can help the physician guide the treatment so that your child has a better outcome going forward. And once we've confirmed the diagnosis, counsel them, send them off to the different specialists, given them a surveillance chart to tell them they need to come at regular intervals and do all these things, we even guide them from antenatal counseling. So once you have the gene in hand, uh, and the parent or the mom is expecting the next pregnancy, we can guide her, we can tell her, we can show her different methods by which she can be uh, sure and know what, what is coming next.